flowers in the street Already withering from the humid Welcome to Make Your Own Fun. I am here with the prickly pair. I've got Mason Summit and Irene Green. Welcome to the show, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you so Happy much. to be here. Thank you so much again. And um, if you're watching, you already saw the intro here and the music you heard was their song, The Long Parade. It's a fantastic song. Great job, guys, on that. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, so I guess just to start off, um, let me know kind of like where the song maybe came from. What was the inspiration for it? Yeah. Um, so it. <laughs> so we were um, we were tasked with writing a song inspired by um, Streetcar Named Desire. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah. So we basically. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have a we have a dog. It's okay. <laughs> um, I have a siren outside. It's full of <laughs> Um. So yeah. So we, we just, for library girl. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, for Good. library girl. So we decided to um to go ahead and 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 come up with a song inspired by that. Yeah. So that's like the basic basis of it. But, that's great and and just in listening to it in the production i love how it kind of starts with um ignore the siren they're not coming for me uh, <laughs> i love the uh, it, it kind of starts with a uh, um like an old kind of uh album kind of crackle and yeah reading kind of almost like a from like a an anthology of like a, a blues music like re like a field recording kind of thing right that, that was, that was cool. great yeah. was that like something intentional where you're like this is the vibe we're gonna go for for that yeah, it's a clip from, it comes from uh, this old mechanical machine called an Optagon, which is kind of like an early synthesizer that plays um, recordings of a band on a disc, like a plastic disc, and then you can change, press buttons to change the chords. There's an app basically i don't have one <laughs> there's an app that has all of the the samples of those so i just stuck that at the beginning that's really cool so yeah i didn't think you were gonna go like the jack white approach which is like the guy is like making his own guitar strings right, <laughs> yeah no right. we don't have any like wire recorders or uh anything like that but third man records um is in the town where we live obviously nashville yes. And they have that like record booth where you. Can oh yeah. Run. yeah. We, I do kind of want to do that. Neil Young recorded a whole album in that booth. So cool. <laughs> oh man, that's that's great. Um, so I guess let's go back a few years, and um, I'm get. I think I read that you guys met in college, and was there a situation where okay, you knew maybe you were taking some of the same classes together and maybe you were kind of um, musically kind of circling each other. Was there a, a point where you were like, oh, I like what this person's doing. I like what this person's doing. Were you both in separate groups or bands at that time? You want to tell it or should I? <laughs> um, well, I, I took a gap year after high school, so I would have been in the same class mm -hmm. as Irene. But when I got to USC, we were in the same songwriting class mm -hmm. and kind of the first day right of class yeah. um the teacher chris sampson asked if anyone would like to just come up and play a song and we both did and i think both of our songs were kind of like among the weirder of the offerings <laughs> that's even little, better yeah a little less of the kind of like pop vibe right some weird chords some weird images um you sang your song uh roswell right which is about <laughs> an alien abduction right. that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then we um part of the class was that you had to have like five collaborative songs written by the end of the semester wow yeah, with, with, with anyone in yeah the class. anyone in the class yeah. and so what did you do um, so yeah, after that first day, I said, you know, I was like, oh, we, we, I think we have similar, you know, things in common here. So 
I'm, I, I was too, I was a little nervous to ask him in person, but I, I used uh, social media and just messaged him. Just lit in my DMs. Exactly. And I just said, I really liked your song and I'd love to write one with you if you'd be interested. And yeah, that's how it, that's how it all started. Do you started. remember what that first song was? Yeah, it's actually not out yet, but we did record it. Oh, wow. um, it was good enough to, to last. <laughs> yeah. It's still up there with my favorites of, of our songs and then we kind of stopped writing after that because we were just hanging out a yeah. lot <laughs> but we had usc had these great practice rooms mm -hmm. with pianos and i thought a good icebreaker because when you're writing a collaborative song you kind of need to have a shared idea mm -hmm. of what you're going to be focusing on whereas when you write a song on your own you can kind of let it reveal itself to you i think so i brought up um coming thinking of like the uh the roswell situation i was thinking of other kind of like cold cases and conspiracy theories and i told you the story of db cooper right. the uh airline hijacker a hero of mine <laughs> and um so that's what we wrote the song about and it's called peace of the sky mm -hmm. and it's not out but it will be out yes but everyone in the class really liked it and it's just a good omen, I think, when when you can have that kind of musical chemistry with someone that you don't even know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I think also not knowing each other personally made us more focused on the task at hand. Right. And then as we got history, to know right. each other, we were less focused on music. Yeah. As a follow up, and this has not that much to do with you guys, and I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but I don't know your your songwriting class, obviously, but when you were in the class, were you looking around and going like, were there a lot of people kind of obsessed with um, fitting into a box and um, using auto tune and making everything really cold and calculated? Because I kind of have to assume that would have been like a major creative turnoff for working with other people, you know? What do you think? <clears throat> I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far for sure. Yeah, definitely say there are people who are writing more like conventional pop but we did have they they sort of gave us like challenges like you know obviously we are not um you know electronic artists but they would have us like top line over a electronic beat or something like write up you know so they they definitely challenged us and and had us do projects more like in that box but i would say generally people were a little bit more like creative or trying yeah. to yeah, like more of that. But there there definitely were uh, challenges like that. And sure. I think the best pop writers are the ones who come to it naturally, mm -hmm. where like we would have classmates who they genuinely were like bearing their soul and writing from the heart. But it came out as like a really good 2010s or 2020s <laughs> pop song, like lucky for them, you know, yeah. that's just what came naturally to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Right on. So I guess um, my next line of questioning is, okay, so you're working on the song. It seems to come together naturally. You got a great creative chemistry. When, I guess, in that process or moving along past that, did you kind of say like, hey, this feels really good. And like, do you want to write more songs or should we like what is the next step to, I guess, like maybe an open mic or or putting a, an act or a band together to, to go out in front of people? How much of a leap forward was that? It took quite a while, honestly. Yeah, I mean, we obviously have known each other for a good amount of time now, but um, I would say it really took, um, <laughs> weirdly, the pandemic to sort of get us into like that mode because I guess, you know, we had a lot of time. Yes. And we're, we were living Quarantine in a, in a one bedroom. So it was like, we were with each other all the time. So we were like, you know, we should, we should do this together. Yes. Cause we, I think like, yeah. especially for me, um, more in my teens and early twenties, I really had the singular goal of solo success and been releasing music on my own and pursuing that for a while with not a lot to show for it, frankly. Um, but we would collaborate on each other's, like, you would come up at one of my shows and sing, and I would play guitar for your right. shows, and um, I produced some solo singles for mm -hmm. you. Yes. 
Um, so we would collaborate and we did a demo of that first song we wrote and put it on SoundCloud. But the idea of actually forming a duo and making that our professional focus, yeah, didn't really come into play until like mid-2021. Right. And I know pretty much um, everybody worth their salt, you know, starts off by doing covers. So was there a mutual kind of uh, meeting of the minds of like, well, these are five singers or five bands that I'm into. Oh, well, these are five singers or five bands. And then there had to have been, just because of the great creative chemistry, there had to have been that meeting of the minds of like, oh, well, I like that band too. And then it's like the genres and the styles kind of melt together. So was there kind of a shorthand when you were initially talking about putting together shows or recordings where you're like, well, let's start doing some covers. Let's let's kind of get like something together, like a set or something. We have to kind of pad it out. So were there some covers that you were kind of surprised each other were like, well, oh, I like that song too. Trying to think. Well, for me, learning that you were taking part in a tribute to the last waltz. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> was a huge uh mm-hmm. I'm not gonna say turn on, but yeah. <laughs> oh my god. It was like wow. She's into the band. Yeah, the band. I didn't say we bonded over the band a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of got you into Elliot Smith. Yes, definitely. But I would say for this project, there's kind of a narrowing of our focus mm-hmm. of influences. Like there's a lot of stuff that we both listen to that really does not come into play in this yes. project. <laughs> for sure. Like I'm a huge Sly and the Family Stone fan, but mm-hmm. you will not see me making a funk album anytime soon right. or a soul album just because it's not I don't think I'm the best person to do that you know right and I don't see you guys doing like a hard turn into like an industrial nine inch nails oh. middle eight break right. but at the same time you're really <laughs> audience is like that. you know like you're really yeah. into tool yeah, and I really like tool and so we yeah, get like mean... there's some heavier rock stuff that we listen to I listen to a lot of like more psychedelic pop like 60s and 70s stuff but lately we've really been immersed full on into like the history of 20th century country music Mm -hmm. going way back like really from the birth of like honky tonk music with like Hank Williams and Jimmy Rogers and Lefty Frizzell to like for us maybe more focusing on the project like Patsy Cline Mm -hmm. is definitely listen to like a lot of the Carter family things like that yeah, some yeah, Carter definitely. family, just foundational stuff. Mother Maybell's guitar style. Mm-hmm. There are specific elements of different artists that we try to bring in. Like for the Long Parade, I was really intru- uh, influenced by the first track on the Bird's Sweetheart of the Rodeo album, You Ain't Going Nowhere. Yeah. Bob Dylan song, they recorded it in Nashville. And the drums on the Long Parade are very influenced by the drums on that song. Listening to a lot of the Nashville production from the 60s and 50s, kind of cutting off in the early 80s, really hard cut off for me (laughs) um, in terms of like establishment country. But basically everything from honky tonk to country politan to outlaw. Right. And right. Just, right. So you're talking basically like um, everything before, like the glossy, like um, Garth Brooks and kind of, um, you know, yes. that kind of streamlined kind of sound. But it's interesting you yeah. bring up the band because I was just thinking about uh, Robbie Robertson the other day and I was thinking what a genius he was as a musical. I would call him a musical director mm-hmm. to know that he had these three totally different singers and they could do the amazing harmony, but he could you know cast like manual richard manual to do like a ray charles kind of song or this and that so what I kind totally of agree. oh yeah yeah so what kind of stuff do you think from the band other than just the songwriting i can't imagine you guys moving to upstate new york and getting a crazy <laughs> house and Probably recording not. in the basement but um well i think it's like it speaks to like what can anyone name a Robbie Robertson solo song? Not really. A Um, couple of them. I mean, anything that's directed by Martin Scorsese. Right. right? He needed like, I think he needed those voices and it's, it is really inspirational to me how he could write a song with like Levon's voice in mind. For me, speaking to the band, Richard Manuel is the big influence on me vocally. Mm -hmm. Obviously he's emulating Ray Charles, but the way, he does it 
Um, there's a lack of pretension, a lack, some might say, of some, you hear some technical flaws, <laughs> like there might be a voice crack, there it's might okay, be. A, you know, it's real. Yeah, well, that's it's, what I love about that stuff. It's like, too. it's not um, auto-tuned to death, you know? Yeah, yeah, like Tears of Rage. Yeah. I just go around the house, like, singing Tears of Rage at the top of my lungs. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? Is. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the first times we performed together was at one of my shows we did It Makes No Difference. Mm. Wow harmonizing on that yeah. it's a very long song mm -hmm. but <laughs> yeah i just could talk about the band for the rest of the <laughs> well okay well let's let's hard turn back into you guys here so um you've been recording singles and i've liked everything i've heard um you know mm -hmm. i was just listening to rosemary and that's just haunting hauntingly beautiful thank you so and much. um yeah and mary's tears is a, a real uh I guess a uh, shit kicker, boot stomper, yeah, crowd <laughs> rousing, like you know, song. Yeah. So, and I noticed a, a huge um, leaps and bounds with with Mary's Tears with the production. So, was that recorded in a different setting than the previous songs? They're all kind of recorded all over the place. I want it to end up sounding like a live band in a room, but it never is. Yeah. Um, they all have the same drummer on them, a guy named Jim Doyle. Mm -hmm. And then for Long Parade, we recorded our vocals with uh, my friend Oliver that I'm in a band with. He's a great engineer. We're in a band called Jaw Talk. Mary's Tears, we got the drums done. Um, drums for that and the Long Parade were done at the same time with Jim. Then I would take it back to our apartment and lay down everything else, basically. Um, my friend Sebastian played bass on it. Okay. I played bass on the first, oh no, Evan, my other bandmate, Evan played bass on Rosemary. We had John McDuffie on Lap Steel on Long Parade, but um, the production, yeah, I guess there was definitely an attempt to write a more upbeat rock oriented song mm -hmm. and also a song that kind of has kind of movements like that last chorus that goes into the halftime have definitely paying attention to the dynamics of it, not having it just be like a single level of energy the whole time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Peaks and valleys. And we recorded the vocals uh, with your brother. Yes, in Nashville. here in Nashville, yeah. He's been engineering a lot of our vocal sessions. But for the most part, that's how we do it, is we get the drums recorded someplace, mm -hmm. usually by our friend Jim. And then pretty much, unless there's a specific instrumentalist that we want to have guest, I kind of do everything else piece by piece, the mm -hmm. keyboards and the bass and the guitars. And that's kind of how I like to do it. Now we have like a room, a dedicated music room. But yes. back in LA, like with Mary's Tears, the first few singles, it would just be laying out all my gear on the coffee table and sitting on the couch. Mm -hmm. That's how yeah. it's got to be done. You know, it's like, it's kind of <laughs> like you got to figure out how to make it. Um, I I thought that when I heard that, I was like, oh, okay. So I don't know, you know, what like your set list <laughs> consists of when you're doing songs, but um, on a stage. But when I heard Mary Sears, I thought, okay, this is either going to be like a, just a kick-ass opening song to pull people in, or it's like an ending of a set song when you're leaving people on a high, that high energy. And it's just like, you know, you hear the word goodnight at the end of the song or something. Yeah, we oh, almost yeah. always close. We do with always that. close. <laughs> yeah. Okay, right on, right on. So I guess, um, what's the story behind the, the lyric? Or was there a, an influence or a life situation that kind of... Yeah, I mean, um, well, as a kid growing up, I definitely listened to um, Goodbye Earl a lot. That's oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say I heard it. Dixie Chicks um, or The Chicks yeah, or whatever they're yeah. called. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I love that song. And we, we definitely, um, I'm also just a fan of like, we really like horror and we like murder ballads. And I think we were just trying to come up with a murder ballad that we thought was a little bit more, I mean, cause oftentimes I feel like the one getting murdered in a murder ballad just happens to be a woman. And so we yes. wanted to kind of, it's so that true. Out. It's such a trope. I know, we and did, we wanted yeah. to flip that on its head, like with that song "Goodbye Earl," and you know, we just thought, yeah, we wanted to to give ourselves a challenge, and I think it, I think it came out. And well. I swear, I had never heard "Goodbye Earl," and then I heard it afterwards, and I was like, oh no! Now um, you're gonna ever hear it ever we go. To, uh, we love a lot of traditional murder ballads that don't really have a specific 
author like Delia's Gone, Banks mm-hmm. of the Ohio, yeah, stuff like that. And then more modern ones like Long Black Veil, um, mm-hmm. you know, written in the 50s. But yet, yeah, like you read about some of the true stories behind some of these events. Like Delia, she was just a poor 14-year-old girl just right. killed by this jealous boyfriend. And then all these songs are like, you know, very, very misogynistic, really. And so we kind of wanted to level the playing field where there's a clear motive, mm. there's a justification. And then also have the subtext of like the lily of the valley flowers, also known as Mary's tears. They're poisonous and mm-hmm. a little bit of a uh, poetic imagery <laughs> yeah. there. Right. But there's a lot of kind of types of country songs where like, mm. you know, there's the train songs and the trucking songs mm-hmm. and the drinking songs, the cheating songs and all the cliches, yeah. songs. <laughs> and a lot of those, like I still have, have yet to write my train song or my drinking song, but that's kind of a nice way to get into it with that kind of prompt. Cause there's such yeah. a lineage of amazing material. To oh drop. yeah. And yeah. if you're ever looking for like the best train songs or um, that kind of folk background, you're not going to get better than like Woody Guthrie or Lead Belly and that kind of stuff. And Definitely. I feel like totally. and Lead all... Belly knew what he was talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. And all of that stuff is like even Dylan will tell you or you'll find out the truth <laughs> that a lot of his stuff is like Civil War ballad stuff that just got passed down or you go to the Library of Congress or um like the folk music anthology and stuff like that. But yeah, the anthology of American music, uh, mm. very big for me, definitely. So let's say, okay, let's move along to you've done some shows and then you do some recording. And then when do you know that at a certain point, there had to be a turning point where you're, it's like catching on people are telling you, Oh, you guys have great harmony together and um, you're getting invited on your radio shows. So when do you kind of feel like you're, you may be both in a, I don't know, canoe, kayak, whatever. And it's <laughs> pressing. A, <laughs> this is a wave, not my hand. It's a wave. And uh, you know, you're, you're feeling like, Hey, we could do this. We could make this our life. Like people are really into this. Like, you know, I, was there thought of like, we need to just record more single songs or was there like an album kind of plan? What do you think? I think we were definitely, I mean, I feel like unfortunately a lot of people these days don't listen to like full albums unless you're like someone very established. Um, but yeah, I think we were, we've just been doing a lot of uh, re- recording singles. We've been doing a lot of like social media content, you know, that kind of stuff, working on that. But I think definitely like the the sense that I get the most that like, oh, this people actually enjoy this is definitely in our in our live performances. I feel like talking to people after shows and just hearing what they have to say really means a lot to me personally, at least, and, yeah. you know, yeah, I think. Right now we're just we're just trying to slowly crawl our way up there. But you know, I think, yeah, I think live performance for me is probably when I feel most connected for sure. I I definitely agree, but for me, the the thing that made me feel the most encouraged in terms of feeling like we were actually reaching people, honestly, has been um TikTok, where we've had a few videos that have gotten like several hundred thousand views Mm -hmm. and like some thousands of likes and obviously it's depressing to talk about your (laughs) like craft or whatever in those metrics but that's what you have to think about if you are trying to do it and yeah when I opened up the app one day and saw like how many views we'd gotten on this one I was like whoa Mm -hmm. that's just was that that the Fleetwood Mac song was was that that cover the Fleetwood Mac song it was um Norma Tanega you're dead the theme song, uh, better known to Gen Z as the theme song for what we do in the shadows. Yes, and, which uh, is a great show. <laughs> we did, I guess our biggest one might have been Roller Skate, right? Oh, yeah. Brand New Key um, by Melanie. Yeah, right. That that caught on on TikTok. For sure. And so those moments have been, 
I've never had that kind of exposure at all as a solo artist or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Me either, for sure. <laughs> but I was just wanting to interject and say, I think that they're, especially coming out of the crap that we've all collectively as a is humanity gone through in the last couple of years. I think people are just yearning for not only experiencing, like we were saying, like that live performance, but just real people playing instruments, singing in harmony, just it, it, you know, the two of you together, even if it's a recording, it has that live feeling, even if, you know, you're layering things on as, you know, production, but um, so I could kind of see how, like, even in small snippets, people are going like, just, you know, reaching on or like almost, almost like if you've had a crap day and you just, that thing where you just connect right away, it's like, you hear a real person, you know, and one of the things I'm sure you've heard a lot from other people is I'm so glad that your songs are about things, not just the cookie cutter, <laughs> yeah. you know, robotic, you know, three minute pop songs. So um, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Cause it's great. But um, so what do you, what do you guys see? Uh, what's the game plan for the next six months or a year? Is, is there one or do you have uh, some things you're going to try to tackle? Yeah. Well, we have our next single is in the can. Mm -hmm. We're waiting on the final artwork for it. And we've done pretty much last month, we finished up about seven or eight songs yes. uh, recorded. So that's the production. Pretty much all the instrumentation is done. The lead vocals are done. We're waiting on some like they're not mixed or anything. But as far as our next releases, pretty much for the foreseeable future, they're all done. Like we'll probably be releasing stuff in two years that we just finished this month right. because That's it's singles, you know, spaced out. So the recording part, that gives us a lot of more free time to focus on other things like yeah. writing. We haven't really been writing as much since we've been recording, yeah. for example. Right, right. And we play live every week at a local barbecue spot. Mm -hmm. We'd like to start getting some more gigs, maybe... My dream would be an opening slot for someone more established mm -hmm. or an opening spot on a tour. I've never really done a real tour. Mm -hmm. And I would love to get one of our songs licensed in a TV show or a movie that's or something. Ideal. Yeah. Right? That's honestly, that's been my main goal for probably about eight years. And so that would be a, a dream mm -hmm. for me. And that's a really good way to get ourselves heard heard and also passive income so you can afford to go do the tour stuff and i'm hoping that you guys are having fun with like the promotion and you know we all dread the the social media thing where it's like oh my god how many things do i have to link together to update <laughs> that i'm gonna do this one thing in two weeks that everybody knows but not everybody's on this one platform yeah. so right. hopefully you're having fun with stuff like um you could say, and I'm sure you've thought about stuff like this, like catch us on our world tour of <laughs> the east, the southeastern corner of Boulder, Colorado, or just, you know, stuff where it's like, OK, these guys get it. They're they're just going to do a local thing, but they're having fun with it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we'd like to come back and play more shows in LA, of course, where we yeah. formed. We were, uh, we kind of, we played a lot at the Hotel Cafe when we first formed, mm -hmm. and that was really nice to have. Like, that's a great place to start out, you know. I didn't have access to that in my, like, teens, for example. Um, so touring more in this country, in the United States, uh, Southwest would be great mm -hmm. to me. Um, yeah, there are a lot of states I've never played so I would like to play in person for more people, but you really are the TikTok czar. The social <laughs> media master. Like, I don't know about she that. She knows like what songs are trending that we should cover and and does all the editing and stuff. And that has gotten us, as I said, the most exposure that we've had. So I'm very grateful for that. It's, <laughs> it's nice to have kind of a division of labor. Where yes, that's been great. <laughs> you can be editing a TikTok while I'm, producing working on a, yeah recording yeah. that's very cool um so i guess i also kind of wanted to delve into a little bit uh with the writing process um do you both kind of keep notebooks or your phones handy if you've got something or i don't know if you're doing that annoying thing where uh you're driving and all of a sudden you have to like uh sing a melody and just pull off the side of the road and you just into your phone right away and then somebody's just like what are you like just go just go 
<laughs> that has happened. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Have you done yeah. a thing where you're at a restaurant or you're sitting across from a friend who's, you know, not in the band or even a family member and they're talking and all of a sudden like the, what I call the little amoeba zygote thing lands in your head of an idea and yes. they're talking, you're like, and they're like, are you having a seizure? Are you okay? I, 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 your phone's about to die. Give me a napkin. Give me a pen. Anybody, please. So, <laughs> yeah. does that happen? I would say the best writing happens when we are very intentional about sitting down, giving ourselves maybe a time limit, mm -hmm. like an hour or two hours where we say we have to have a finished song or even just a couple of verses and a chorus. Mm -hmm. We tend to be very productive with those kinds of self-imposed deadlines. If yes. I don't have that, honestly, it's very rare for me that inspiration will just strike and then I'll write mm -hmm. a complete song. I really need to have some sort of an imposed discipline Lately, I've been getting into a different kind of songwriting process of building up tracks and music first um, that I can then listen to on my own, not having to be multitasking with the instruments and kind of see if anything comes to me on the lyric side, building up some potential prickly pear tracks. Um, but we both play mm -hmm. um, like Long Parade was one that you started with the chorus. Right. Mary's Tears was more one that we kind of sat down together. But oftentimes, yeah, one of us will have a few lines or a chorus or a verse, mm -hmm. and then the other will kind of help jump in and help take it along further. Have you uh, have you had a, a riff or a piano melody or something in your head that you're playing over and over and you have like the one line and you're stuck on it for like a week or something and then you're around the apartment or whatever playing it and the other one is going like, stop it. Like I can just imagine <laughs> one of you like playing guitar and singing something like, um, you know, she's selling flowers on the side of the street or whatever the lyric is and then just thinking and then going back and then playing the riff again and then singing the line again and again has that happened where I mean I think that happens to everybody on every creative right. level where it's like you gotta keep it fresh in the moment where like no today's the day today's the hour I'm gonna get this verse or I'm gonna you know work on this chorus if it kills me and then your <laughs> your songwriting partner is just like <laughs> I will say like the most frustrating feeling to me is to have like half a song done. Yeah, for sure. Because you feel so good and elated about what you have, but then you also basically feel like you have nothing to show for it because right. you don't have anything until you have a complete song. Right. And to me, the real reason I write songs beyond any sort of musical interest is purely just the feeling of self-satisfaction <laughs> I'm proud of myself when I finish it right. I just get kind of uh elated and that's a feeling that I don't have all of the time so whenever I finish writing a song I'm just like wow I gotta chase that feeling you know oh yeah I, don't, I honestly don't do it as often as I should mm. a lot of writers write every day I can go months without writing a song because yeah. as I said I really have to make the time and be intentional about it yeah or be inspired by something that you want to write about that subject like i find it frustrating too if i'm like writing a poem or a short story or i'm, I'm working on a, a a short film or something and i show it to a friend or somebody or you know whoever and it's not done and i have to like fill in the blanks for them like and you you know you sound like a freaking idiot because you're like, and then in this part, well, the guy, it's not here, but the guy's going to come over here and he's going to be like right. this. And then like, and then the person's just like, right. <laughs> I can't imagine like you playing like a, a verse or a, something for a song and you're like, well, I, and then I think we're going to maybe put like a middle A and then the, the, those are going to be a solo and the person's going to be like just slowly like eating a sandwich like. <laughs> keep it up man sounds good it is really easy to get hung up on the middle eight uh, yeah. bridges are pretty challenging although of course in country music you don't have a lot of bridges all the time um so and i also just feel like the thing that this project has given me is more focus um like obviously it's good to not put yourself in a stylistic box Right. But my solo stuff is really all over the place. Like I have mm -hmm. kind of 
jazzy songs and rock songs and folky songs and to kind of be able to somewhat pull from a bag of tricks Mm -hmm. where like okay now what they would do what George and Tammy would do is there would be a little key change right here you know right stuff like that um kind of helps you know I'd say having the kind of knowledge that we do and that we're working on amassing our kind of database of inspiration from the greats helps us to come up with new things. Very cool. Very cool. Well, as we're winding it down here, I know this thing moves like a freight train, but um, where can the folks uh, find your work online? Where would you like them to kind of be funneled into like a main website or a hub? Yeah. um, On all platforms were the prickly pair music. And it's P-A-I-R. <laughs> I know there's a P-A-I-R. I saw that one too. I'm like, cactus? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. And so yeah. we have a link. Our link tree will take you yes, to all, all of the, the links. The link tree. As, <laughs> exactly. it, as it does. Link tree slash the prickly pear music. Um, our, we're streaming on all the platforms. Mm-hmm. Usually our weekly gig um, at Drifters here in Nashville, we stream it on Twitch and Facebook. Yes. And uh, we post a lot of clips on TikTok as well. On TikTok, we have an Instagram, not Twitter yet, but no, I don't think <laughs> I don't know about. Twitter. I don't think now's the time to join Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's a ooh, it's a mess. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for coming on the show and uh, just enjoy the conversation. I think thank you, you guys, guys just sure. nothing but like infinite horizons for you guys. I think that. You know, the, the harmonies are great. The, the songwriting so authentic. Um, it's organic. I think people are just going to flock to it. Um, and the more stuff you put out, the more uh, people I think you're going to get. And uh, I, we have a little special surprise for the for people who are going to be watching this. This is going to be online on Wednesday, the 22nd. And uh, going into the credits here, we're going to have your song Mary's Tears playing. So they're going to enjoy that as well. Awesome. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having us. No problem, guys. Enjoy the rest of your weekend and nothing but the best. Thank you. You too. too. Bye now. Great Bye, time. Eric. Thanks. Daddy told her how to shoot as soon as she could hold.